good morning from Atlanta, Georgia. I'm John McIntyre, a professor in the Scheller College of Business at Georgia Institute of Technology and the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs. Uh, we're now running into our 30, 30th year of running a federally funded National Center of Excellence. We have looked at a whole range of topic, topics focused on India, among other things. And we're delighted today uh, to collaborate with uh, my colleague, Annie Agniotri, who is chair of the USA-India Business Summit and also CEO of a Marshall Automation America company, uh, US and India based. Um, this collaboration goes back some uh, 15 years ago, uh, and we have uh, put together a number of insightful webinars and meetings ranging across a policy topic. Uh, today, we have uh, some distinguished panelists to address the issue of the rise of Indian sea levels in global operations, using the term global op operations to mean leadership of companies, not only in the United States, which is, of course, an in the interesting focus, but really globally uh, outside of Southeast Asia. Uh, we're going to have some opening remarks, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Jagdesh Seth of Emory University, who is the Charles Kelstad Professor of uh, Business and Marketing, well known to most of us who uh, deal with India, uh, also recipient of the Padma Bhushan Award from the Government of India some two, three years ago. We'll start with you, Jag, if I may, and then I'll follow up with some general remark, uh, remarks on uh, the search for global talent. Uh, and then we will start the first session. We have about uh, 15 minutes to do so. So Jag, the floor is yours. If you would share with us some of your life experience, which extends really uh, over a long period of the Indian uh, presence uh, in, in the United States, but also in the world in leadership positions uh, in global firms, uh, that would be uh, most welcome. Thank you, John, for the invitation and uh, welcome to all my colleagues on the panel. It's a very, very distinguished panel with lots of experiences and the wisdom. Uh, the rise of the Indian diaspora at the leadership level is not limited to corporation but also to the academic world, the scientific world. It's happening across the board, which says that there must be something as a continuity or connectivity between different occupations and the rise of the Indian uh, CEOs or C-level people. My view is that there are two parts to the whole theory or this story. One is the context of globalization itself which is an enabling factor for the rise. And the other, of course, is the Indian background of the Indian CEOs who have risen to the top. The first part is very important to understand that the global operations are always contextual. They're defined by context of culture, administrative policies that vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. They're defined by geopolitics, the relationship with the host country to the guest countries, for example, or if you're of Chinese origin, the way the world looks upon you as opposed to if you're of Indian origin or American origin, for example, for that matter. And of course, the level of prosperity of that nation, which varies enormously from very poor nations to very affluent nations. So the context is very important to understand. It has become more important recently the, our increasing notion of uh, what we call black swan events. I mean, pandemic was a classic case. But, so the main factor is uh, contextual. And as I mentioned, there are four contextual areas which are changing dramatically. Uh, the biggest context change, of course, is climate change. But you also have the swan Black Swan events, such as, for example, the pandemic and its impact, which you already experienced all of us. 
there's a constant flooding on the one hand, fires on the other hand, earthquakes on the third hand, and you have to manage these physical calamities that take place, like crisis management. So how can you be a Red Cross also at the same time? More importantly, it requires huge amount of resilience. Are you able to adapt and change? And I think that's a theme will come about. And anything that's planned out is not necessarily what's going to happen. So something about resilience, something about improvisation, clearly is a skill set that is needed more and more as we go ahead. This is compounded by a second major factor, which is technology advance. Technology is moving so rapidly. Half-life of knowledge is getting less and less. In software, it is down to 18 months and declining. Management knowledge itself is changing dramatically. What we teach to the MBA students in two years, by the time they graduate, the knowledge is only half valuable. It's changing that dramatically. I did not know anything about quantum computing, let alone AI, generated AI, for example. Uh, let alone e-commerce at one time, or block, blockchain. Uh, these are all new technological things that are impacting us day to day, pretty much in the business operations. I think the increasing diversity is another major problem to manage in a context wise. You have the age diversity rising worldwide. Cultural diversity is rising with more mobility within Europe, more mobility within the ASEAN countries more mobility into the US from everybody. So the diversity of cultures or ge ge demographic diversity is rising. Cultural diversity is rising in the process also. And of course, economic diversity. How do you manage such a diverse organization is a very key area. If none of this was enough, you have the huge populism. Governments are very unpredictable. Predicting the same party winning again, 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 seems to be almost not likely to happen. In fact, if anything else, there's an in incumbency curve, curse, and there, because of that, who comes in the power changes the policy, both social policy, economic policy, and the geopolitics. What you need is a very strong communication skills. The leader has to communicate on a global basis, key issues, either on social media platforms or some other place. Now, why, therefore, the Indian diaspora rising to the sea level? What is unique about the Indian managers in general? And here are four or five factors. First of all, Indian managers grow up already in a diverse culture, not like European Union where you are a German, but remain in Germany. You are French, remain in France, Italian, remain in Italy. But people live in neighborhoods from the early childhood. They go to schools where diverse cultures are already here. Pretty much. So how do you manage? You know how to coexist. You have the tolerance and appreciation and understanding of different types of people, different languages they speak at home, different food they serve, for example, which is interesting. And this continues not only just in school, in neighborhood, but in colleges also, and education. To me, that factor makes them a little more globally understandable people, and that gives them an edge, as opposed to being in one country with one language alone. Second major area is career itself. Usually a typical Indian manager out of India, especially, will be placed in a foreign country by a multinational. Very common was the case with the Hindustan Lever or Unilever where you go to a top engineering college, IIT, you immediately get your MBA called IIM, you join a company like Hindustan Lever or Unilever, they immediately will send you out to Thailand or Indonesia. You are totally in a stranger place, you don't know the language, you don't know the culture, you have to learn how to adapt. So adaptation becomes very important skill set in the process. So that's the second key area that comes about with the career path. And the career path is not limited just to, in fact, uh, country-wise, but also functional-wise. There's a cross-functional uh, experiences that many, very often the Indian managers get moving from, let's say, engineering function to a design function to supply chain to, for example, marketing, whatever comes out in the case. 
So that means they make they are basically more deep generally survive problem. More importantly, most of them have a strong technical background. And as you know, in today's world, technology matters. Doesn't matter whether you're a package goods company, they have their own R and D research centers. Procter Gamble, for example, in Singapore alone has 500 scientists working on flavors and fragrances larger than MIT's budget in a comparable discipline, for example. So corporate R&Ds are very important entities that you need to play, you need to work with. And I think having technical background enables you quite a lot. I experienced that at companies like Motorola as an advisor, for example, it's an engineering driven company. So was Bell Labs, engineering driven Western Electric, for example. I can give you all corporate experiences. Repro, which I set on the board, the same thing. You have to have a technical expertise and therefore the recruitment comes from very well-educated engineering students. Some of them immediately do their MBA or management. Combining that management and technical education seems to be a common denomination among most of the people who rise through the Indian diaspora, essentially. You have about, uh, Jag, you have about two minutes left to stick to schedule. Yeah. And language also is very key. Most of them are, even though they have their native language, they basically are trained in English, which allows them the mobility on a worldwide basis because English is the best language. However, the last punchline that I have is that surprisingly, this is something yeah. I've They're more like diplomats in many ways, which means that we are always a minority. Any place you go, you're a minority. So if you're of Indian origin, placed in Thailand, you're a minority in Thailand. Placed in Indonesia, you're a minority. Placed in Gulf countries, you're a minority. Placed in America, you're a minority. So minorities have a behavior in which for them to be accepted alone requires more understanding, more communication skills, more adjustment and adaptation. Your personal values may be one thing, but your professional values are very much comparable to the corporate values in many ways. How do you separate the two is very key also. So those are my observations why Indian uh, diaspora is rising to the sea level across corporations, not limited to technology, but you can see any business today, you can find that very much the case. Uh, for example, uh, businesses like FedEx, Starbucks recently, for example, I can give you many, many examples, but those are my observations. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jag. I know you sit on very many boards, both in India and the United States. So your experience is invaluable. Let me...